In this video, we will go over uh, the enzyme ribonucleotide reductase. So ribonucleotide reductase works on a nucleotide diphosphate. So it's very important that we recognize that it's working on the diphosphorylated form of the nucleotide. And in doing so, it takes the diphosphorylated form of a nucleotide diphosphate and essentially strips the, let's highlight this, essentially strips the oxygen atom from the number two carbon of the ribose ring. So here's the number two carbon of the ribose ring and ribonucleotide reductase actually removes that oxygen, generating the deoxy version, the deoxy ribose of the nucleotide diphosphate. So essentially this is DNA for all practical purposes. So if we remember our and review our de novo biosynthesis, uh, we first started out with AMP. This was made, uh, if you remember, from IMP. So we first started out generating by de novo biosynthesis the heterocyclic purines AMP and GMP. Then we moved to the pyrimidines we first made through a six-step pathway UMP. Uh, from UMP, we actually um, had to phosphorylate this to the triphosphorylated form UTP. And then from UTP through the enzyme cytidine synthetase utilizing um, ATP energy and amino, uh, the amino group is donated by the amino acid glutamine, we actually generated CTP. So it's very interesting to note that uh, we make CTP, we make the triphosphorylated form of cytosine, whereas all the other ones, AMP and GMP and UMP, we make the monophosphorylated form. Well, if we want to make DNA, uh, these have to work on the diphosphorylated forms. So this has to work theoretically on ADP and GDP and CDP in order to get the corresponding deoxy or the DNA versions of these nitrogenous bases. Notice also another thing that's missing here in our inventory, we have accounted for AMP, GMP, UMP, and CTP, though it's in the triphosphorylated form that it's made from cytidine synthetase, uh, we have not looked into thymine. So um, thymine is made very differently. Thymine is actually made from deoxy UMP. So notice that we have to take UDP. Okay, we have to then from UDP take it back to UM. Uh, we have to make UDP converted to deoxy UDP, excuse me. And then from deoxy UDP, we have to remove a phosphate to deoxy UMP. And it is this substrate, deoxy UMP, that gets converted to deoxy TMP. Okay, the methyl donor for this reaction comes from tetrahydrofolate that donates the methyl group. So we will talk about this reaction actually later on in this lecture. But um, uh, two interesting facets that I want you to know right now is that cytosine is made as the triphosphorylated form. And as far as thymine is concerned, uh, we don't make uh, thymine as a monophosphate. Thymine is exclusively a member of DNA. So we actually make the deoxy TMP form. We make the deoxy TMP form from deoxy UMP form, which means that UDP has to get converted to, remember, ribonucleotide reductase only works on the diphosphorylated form of the nucleotide. So this theoretically means that UDP must get converted to deoxy UDP. That's ribonucleotide reductase. Then that deoxy UDP has to have a phosphate stripped. The enzyme that does this is called UPPase. Phosphate must get stripped to give us DUMP, and then finally DUMP gets converted to deoxy TMP. The enzyme that does this is thymidylate synthase. The methyl donor for that is tetrahydrofolate. So a uh, very interesting scenario here and how we get to DNA. Another very interesting scenario is that ribonucleotide reductase only works on the nucleotide diphosphorylated form, that version of the nucleotide.
So there's different classes of ribonucleotide reductases. We're going to focus on the class one ribonucleotide reductase. This is generally found in higher level organisms as well as E. coli. There's also something called a class three ribonucleotide reductase, and that one is found in microorganisms that are anaerobic. Uh, so we're not going to focus on anaerobic ribonucleotide reductases. We will just simply focus on the aerobic version. Uh, it's a heavily complicated enzyme. As you can see here, um, it exists as a dimer that's R2, a dimer that's R1. So it basically exists as a heterotetramer, an R1 dimer joined together with an R2 dimer right at the interface. There are several different types of active sites here. Uh, first, I want to bring your attention to the oxygen. The oxygen uh, is one form of the active site that's coordinated by um, two Fe3, Fe plus 3 centers. So Fe plus 3 is the ferric ion that coordinates this oxygen atom. Uh, the oxygen atom is also coordinated by some glutamate side chains, uh, aspartate side chains as well. Uh, so the active site amino acids also coordinate that oxygen. Uh, an interesting thing here that uh, makes this a very unique enzyme is that mechanistically uh, it works through a tyrosine radical, also known as a tyrosyl radical. And that radical sort of helps in stripping that oxygen atom. Remember what ribonucleotide reductase is doing. It's stripping the oxygen atom from the number two carbon, converting a ribonucleotide to a deoxy ribonucleotide. That is what ribonucleotide reductase does. And it's heavily, heavily regulated. So um, there's a, the heterotetramer can actually form an even more active hexamer. And uh, coming back to the regulation, the regulation is both at the deoxy level as well as the ribonucleotide level. And I want to bring your attention also to the fact that the regulation is also at the triphosphorylated level. Okay. So a lot of moving parts here. For one thing, uh, ribonucleotide reductase, if you remember back from the previous slide, is taking the diphosphorylated form of the nucleotide, diphosphorylated, and converting it to the deoxy diphosphorylated form of the nucleotide, deoxy, the DNA version. So it only works on the diphosphorylated form. But look here, very interestingly, the regulation, uh, how fast this enzyme and the specificity for the enzyme amongst the various nucleotide substrates, the specificity uh, and regulation is determined by the triphosphorylated versions of the nucleotide, both, both at the deoxy level or at the ribonucleotide level. So coming back to the active site, we have, uh, this is one monomer of the active site. Uh, so another active site forms with the same uh, iron plus three centers, oxygen epicenter, tyrosyl radical, that forms a dimer. Um, want to bring your attention here to the sulfhydryl groups. That sulfhydryl groups are going to be also important in the mechanism of stripping this oxygen atom from the number two carbon. So here's an up close view of the um, active site residue. Okay, here is the oxygen in the minus two oxidation number state. Here's iron plus three. One of the iron plus threes, it's coordinated by an aspartate. I'll highlight these in red. So these active site residues are crucial in keeping that iron in place as well as keeping this O minus two uh, oxide anion also in place. And here we have a histidine and a glutamate coordinating the iron epicenter here. Also, do not uh, under, uh, excuse me, do not underestimate the radical form. So a lot of moving parts here. First, we have the iron plus three. This is um, a dimer. This is the R2 dimer. We have an iron plus three. We have a radical that's associated with tyrosine. And then we have the coordination of the oxygen through all of these amino acids, specifically histidine, aspartate, glutamate, another glutamate, and a histidine here. Remember, this is a dimer. So on the left-hand side is one subunit of the R2 dimer. On the right-hand side is the other subunit of the R2 dimer. 
joining to this R2 dimer is the R1 regulation uh, dimer that sort of regulates which nucleotide diphosphate, again, diphosphate, is going to get converted to the deoxynucleotide diphosphate. So let's go over the mechanism of ribonucleotide reductase. So the first thing is the enzyme is actually going to work through its tyrosyl radical. That's one of the active sites of the enzyme. Also, don't forget, it's worth reiterating that this is working on the diphosphorylated form of the nucleotide. It's taking the nucleotide diphosphorylated form, converting it to the deoxy uh, nucleotide diphosphorylated form. So it's work working on the diphosphorylated form. So uh, the tyrosyl radical is going to abstract a proton from the number three carbon. When it does so, it's going to leave a radical here on the number three carbon. If I were to focus my laser pointer, um, the main action is going to be on this number two carbon. However, in the number two carbon, we have to actually remove that oxygen. So that's where most of the action is going to occur. But right uh, for now, we have the free radical on the number three carbon. Also associated with this enzyme are some free thiol groups. So remember, this is the reduced form of thiol group associated with the amino acid cysteine. So the hydroxyl group associated with carbon number two, where most of the action is going to occur, is going to pick up a proton from one of the cysteines. And when it does so, we have here water. I like this have here water. So water is actually a very good leaving group, so water leaves. And in doing so, we have a resonance stabilized form of this radical. So here you have the radical associated with carbon number three. That's resonance stabilized. So you see the resonance stabilization right here. It gives a little bit of a half-life to the radical. But also when the water leaves, you have a very, very powerful electrophile right here along the number two carbon. This electrophile is going to abstract that proton from the cysteine and in doing so, regenerate the deoxy version of the nucleotide. Coming back to this resonance stabilized free radical, that resonance stabilized free radical is going to abstract that proton and in doing so, it regenerates the tyrosyl radical and we have our final product. And in our final product, we have generated the deoxy version of the nucleotide diphosphate, again, realizing it's the diphosphate, the nucleotide diphosphate version is now uh, deoxy. It has an oxygen removed from the number. So with the oxygen removed from the number two carbon giving us the deoxy ribonucleotide diphosphate, the question comes in to those thiols. So the thiols um, from ribonucleotide reductase donated its electrons. In doing so, um, they become um, oxidized. So um, what we have here is a situation where we need to regenerate those thiol groups. Right? So we need to generate the SH groups uh, so that it can donate those electrons to the ribonucleotide reductase mechanism. So um, this ribonucleotide reductase actually works in concert with thyroredoxin. So thyroredoxin it, in it of itself has some SH groups from the cysteines. It donates its reducing equivalents. It itself gets that disulfide bond, gets oxidized, and in doing so, it reduces and it donates its reducing equivalents. It donates those electrons to ribonucleotide reductase. So once ribonucleotide reductase is in this configuration, it can continue the mechanism that we saw in the previous slide. You see, going back to that previous slide and that mechanism, uh, we generated this. Pick it up with my pen here. We generated this, uh, but we really need this to start cycle number two or cycle number three or whatever cycle uh, the third or fourth cycle of the reaction. So if we generate this, we need to regenerate the original configuration of those thiol groups. Remember, those thiol groups um, picked up, help protonate uh, uh, and make water the leaving group if you review the mechanism from the previous slide. So thioredoxin actually in its oxidation, 
reduces ribonucleotide reductase so that another cycle and subsequent catalytic cycles can occur. But it's much more complicated than this because now a next question is, this is like a domino effect. Um, well, thyroredoxin is oxidized. How do we re reduce re-reduce thyroredoxin so that this cycle, another thyroredoxin molecule can come back again and help reduce another ribonucleotide reductase. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that once you've generated thyroredoxin in its oxidized form, you're going to have to regenerate the reduced form for this cycle to occur again in order for the next ribonucleotide reductase cycle to occur again. So this is like a wheel rotating another wheel rotating another wheel. So where does this begin and where does this end? So, well, I can answer this question very succinctly and tell you that it begins with NADPH. So NADPH, as shown here in the next slide, donates electrons, and it's going to donate its electrons to an enzyme known as thyroredoxin reductase. Thyroredoxin reductase is an enzyme that contains a flavin cofactor, flavin adenine dinucleotide. It also itself contains some cysteines in the form of an oxidized and reduced cysteine moiety. So thyroredoxin reductase um, actually works in concert with thyroredoxin. So here we have NADPH starting this. This is part of our pool here. Remember, NADPH is involved in reductive biosynthesis. It's also involved in redox, uh, excuse me, free radical detoxification. But NADPH will donate its electrons, itself get oxidized. When it gets oxidized, it will donate those electrons and reduce FAD to FADH2. FADH2 within thyroredoxin reductase will then donate its electrons to the disulfide, thereby reducing the disulfide to the individual thiols. Now those individual thiols will donate its electrons to thyroredoxin. This is what we've studied before in the previous slide. It will donate those electrons to thyroredoxin and in return reduce the disulfide. And then finally those electrons will donate to ribonucleotide reductase, the SH groups, the three thiols, and then the free thiols, as we saw in the mechanism two slides ago, will take the nucleotide diphosphate and convert it to the di deoxy, excuse me, convert it to the deoxy nucleotide diphosphate. So essentially NADPH donates its electrons from the cytoplasmic pool. It donates it to reduce FADH2, FADH2 reduces the thiol and thyroredoxide reductase. The thyroredoxin reductase reduces the SHs and thyroredoxin. The SHs reduces, reduce, excuse me, the SHs in ribonucleotide reductase. And then those SHs reduce the nucleotide diphosphate to the deoxynucleotide diphosphate. So this is an essentially a mini electron transport chain that works with ribonucleotide reductase. Remember here, the overall goal is to continue, not after one reaction, not after two reactions, but to keep the ribonucleotide reductase catalytic cycle in motion. To keep it in motion, NADPH donates those electrons. It donates it thyro to thyroredoxin reductase, which in turn donates it to thyroredoxin, which in turn donates it to ribonucleotide reductase, which in turn donates it to the nucleotide diphosphate, converting it to the deoxynucleotide diphosphate. So it's very important that equal amounts of the nucleotide uh, triphosphates are made, um, and elevated amounts or excess amounts of deoxy ATP is lethal. In fact, any um, excess amounts of any of these nucleotide ditros, uh, di triphosphates, excuse me, whether it's a deoxy GTP or deoxy CTP or deoxy PTP, they must be uh, at equal amounts. If they're at unequal amounts, what happens is that there's errors that get incorporated during DNA replication. 
and the raw nucleotide is incorporated in DNA during replication, and that causes errors during cellular division. So uh, any excess amounts of these are lethal. So it's very, very important that there are equal amounts of these are made. So that, that is why ribonucleotide reductase is very much exclusively, exclusively regulated. In fact, there is a disease known as SID, which stands for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Syndrome. SCID results in excess amounts or high level amounts of deoxy ATP at the expense of deoxy GTP, deoxy CTP, and deoxy TTP. Uh, people with severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome have elevated amounts of deoxy ATP. And uh, that is a very devastating disease as a result of the unequal amounts of the nucleotide triphosphates. So given that, um, it's very important that ribonucleotide reductase is regulated. And you can see here uh, that the regulation occurs both at the deoxy level and also at the ribonucleotide level. So here we have a, a kind of a very complicated scenario here to ensure that all of these are equal to one another. As an example, uh, ADP actually induces uh, the reduction of CDP to deoxy CDP and UDP to deoxy C UDP. Interestingly enough, it's the deoxy version of TTP that induces the reduction of, D of GDP, excuse me, to deoxy GDP. Uh, it's that same it's that same deoxy TTP that inhibits, this time it inhibits uh, deoxy CDP and deoxy UDP generation. Here we have a deoxy GTP um, that stimulates deoxy ADP generation. It's that same deoxy GDP that inhibits the CDP deoxy form and the deoxy UDP form. And finally, uh, we have sort of the master regulator the deoxy ATP inhibits reduction of all the nucleotide diphosphates. So ribonucleotide reductase works on the diphosphorylated form of the nucleotides, but regulation, interestingly enough, happens at both the ribonucleotide level and the deoxy nucleotide level, and regulation occurs at the triphosphorylated level as well. Okay, here uh, we have ADP, the diphosphorylated form, also being involved in regulation. Uh, activity is also influenced by dimerization. So here we have the active dimer version of ribonucleotide reductase, but we also have an even um, higher active version, which is the hexameric version. Another active version is the tetrameric version. Remember, ribonucleotide reductase is, exists as an R1 form, which is a dimer, and an R2 dimer. It has iron plus three, it has oxygen, and it also has a tyrosyl radical as part of its mechanism. So what influences dimerization, um, the active tetramer, and the even more active hexamer form of ribonucleotide reductase has to do with the levels of the nucleotide triphosphates. Again, uh, this exquisite level, high resolution level of of uh, regulation ensures, is meant to ensure at the very least, that we have equal amounts, okay? All of these nucleotide tri triphosphates must be in equal amounts in order for DNA to be efficiently replicated. You don't want mistakes in your DNA uh, when it gets replicated. So uh, by ensuring equal amounts of these nucleotide triphosphates uh, through this exquisite mechanism, uh, we tend to think this is how ribonucleotide reductase prevents any types of DNA errors, as well as any types of diseases such as SCIDS, severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. Finally, in the last two slides, we will talk about how uh, the cell generates the, uh, TMP. So notice here we're generating deoxy TMP. Um, if we review, basically it was AMP, GMP, and then UMP. We made CTP by cytodelate synthetase, where ATP and glutamine were the um, amino donors. But um, 
here we make the deoxy version of TMP. Okay, and that makes sense because thymine is found in DNA um, exclusively, whereas the other nitrogenous bases are found both in DNA and RNA. So how is this made? Uh, it's made from deoxy UMP. So coming back to our de novo biosynthesis of pyrimidines, UMP gets converted to UDP, and then ribonucleotide reductase converts that to deoxy UDP. Remember, ribonucleotide reductase only works on the diphosphorylated forms. And then, strangely enough, the deoxy UDP has to get a phosphate removed. The enzyme that does this is UTPase. It must, get, say, it must get a phosphate removed. When it gets a phosphate removed, then that DUMP gets converted to DTMP. So the difference between DUMP and DTMP is that methyl group. Who donates the methyl group? That's right, methylene tetrahydrofolate donates that methyl group. When methylene tetrahydrofolate donates that methyl group, it becomes dihydrofolate. And a very important enzyme regenerates regenerates that methyl regenerates that methylene tetrahydrofolate, and that enzyme is dihydrofolate reductase. So thiamidylate synthase generates deoxy TMP from deoxy UMP. That's the enzyme here. And in doing so, N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate donates the methyl group. When it donates the methyl group, tetrahydrofolate becomes dihydrofolate. Dihydrofolate reductase regenerates the methylene tetrahydrofolate. Dihydrofolate reductase um, utilizes NADPH, oxidizes that NADPH to NAD+. Dihydrofolate reductase then generates the tetrahydrofolate, which in turn generates the methylene tetrahydrofolate to allow thymidylate synthase to continue the second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and subsequent rounds. So uh, dihydrofolate reductase is important. There's a number of drugs known as antifolates used in anti-cancers or chemotherapy drugs, and three antifolate drugs are shown here. One is methotrexate, the other one is amenoterin, and the other one is trimethoprim. And these work to target dihydrofolate reductase in cancers. So these are cancer or chemotherapeutic drugs. And uh, what's the mechanism of this? The mechanism of this is to prevent the regeneration of tetrahydrofolate which is required to, remember, folate carries carbons. So in this case, tetrahydrofolate is carrying uh, carbon as the methyl group. And um, so to prevent the generation of tetrahydrofolate, dihydrofolate reductase is targeted in these cancer cells. Another target for cancer cells is 8-fluorouracil. So this is a competitive inhibitor of thymidylate synthase. And it's also used uh, as a chemotherapeutic drug. Let me write this properly here. 8-fluorouracil is the name of this competitive inhibitor. You see, 8-fluorouracil looks just much like uracil. 8-fluorouracil, okay? deoxy, uh, deoxy UMP, deoxy UMP with the fluorine at the number 8 carbon is a competitive inhibitor. The enzyme picks this up and it sort of locks the enzyme. You now, because of that competitive inhibition caused by 8-fluorouracil, you do not generate deoxy TMP. And for a cancer cell, that means uh, you cannot have um, DNA or RNA synthesis. So it's a target, uh, particularly targeting the generation of deoxy TMP, thymine, and 8-fluorouracil uh, is an anti-cancer drug, which is a competitive inhibitor of this enzyme. 
So some cancer chemotherapeutic targets, one is a target of thymidylate synthase, which generates the DNA deoxy version of deoxy TNP. And another anti-cancer target is dihydrofolate reductase, which regenerates the tetrahydrofolate to allow thymodilate synthase to allow that reaction to proceed further.